Wow, wow. Isn't it so good to be in person? My family, we lived here for over 15 years, and to be able to come back, it's like a spiritual homecoming. I feel so indebted when I look around this room. Literally, my heroes in the faith, my spiritual dad, my my pastors and leaders. Pastor Chris, I appreciate your leadership. I appreciate even more your friendship. But friends don't let friends preach last. After all that we've been fed, uh, we've been fed so we've been fed so much. Uh, John, thank you for unpacking that just apostolic father moment. Are you thankful that John Speaker unpacked his suitcase and just imparted to us the ascent mindset? Come on, mindset is more important than skill set. We have to lean into what he was saying. So many, so many good things. Um, but here we are. Everyone today wants to talk about the goat. Who is the goat? The greatest of all time, right? Whether it's a musician, an actor, or a sports lead, the, the goats, right? Who, who's the goat? I hear about the goat all the time. Now, I grew up as a child of the 80s. So one of the, come on, where are the people at a child of the 80s? A few of you, a few of you. One of the highlights of being a child of the 80s was being able to see the 1992 Dream Team play basketball. Okay, so let's just set the story straight. The best basketball team ever assembled in mankind's history. I think we have a picture here. Where's the dream? Look at this, huh? The short shorts are coming back. I mean, these, these, these guys, I was 11 years old watching the dream team dominate the 1992 Olympics. Uh, let me just give you a few stats, and I won't belabor the point for those of you who hate sports, but this will make sense. They used zero timeouts in the entire Olympics to win gold. Okay, let's just let that sit there for a second. They scored an average of 119 points a game. They never scored less than 100 points. Their average win was 44 points a game. They had 117 NBA All-Star appearances amongst the team, 23 championships, and get this, 10 out of the 12 players on the team were listed in the top 50 all-time NBA players. They're the GOATs. But among the GOATs, there was the GOAT, if you talked to Magic Johnson, all the guys would, would, that were interviewed would say, the best basketball I ever played in my life was practice between the dream team and head and shoulders above every other player was Michael Jordan. And I, he, I, all right, here, I'm preaching the gospel. He, he <laughs> Over quarantine, I'm not sure if you were like a Tiger King type person, you were the chosen type thing. I don't know what you watched, but one of the things I watched was the Last Dance documentary, which talked a little bit about Michael's story. Uh, here's a couple tweets just to, just to show you. I think we might even have a picture here. Yeah. Some things we learned about Michael Jordan, don't taunt him. He will remember it forever, and it will motivate him to destroy you. Second thing to know, don't not taunt him. It will allow him to create fictional taunts from which he will be even more effective at motivating himself to destroy you. Okay. <laughs> I love this next tweet. This is great. How many, how many of you know the goats, they have like a crazy mindset? If Michael Jordan would have gotten therapy, he would have averaged four points a game. <laughs> okay, so when we start talking about what it makes to be the goat... You got to be a little crazy, obviously. Like, you have to have such a laser focus. You have to have such a work ethic, a lot of confidence, maybe some of that arrogance, um, some grit. Here, here's Michael Jordan's advice for the rest of us that are, that are like lower humans. Watch this. If you quit once, it becomes a habit. Never quit. So that sounds great, although I'm human, Michael. <laughs> right? So, so what creates the GOAT? Now, the funny thing is, someone asked Michael Jordan recently if he thought his Bulls team would be able to beat LeBron's Lakers team. And his answer was astonishing. He said, yeah, we would, but only by a few points. And they said, why only by a few points? He said, probably five points. He, he said, it would be a fairly close game because, you know, most of us are almost in our 60s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's just a whole nother mindset on a different, like, okay. I have resolved that I will never see come out of Michael Jordan's lips calling someone else the goat. But what do you do when you turn to the pages of Scripture, and it's clear to us that the perfect, sinless Son of God is the goat. He is the greatest of all time. He is the servant of humanity. But what do you do when Jesus calls someone else the goat? 
you're shocked. That's where I was this year. Matthew 11, let me read to you. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 11, he says, truly I tell you, usually he has to say that when you're not going to believe what he's about to tell you. Among those born of women, there was not risen another greater than John the Baptist. Do you realize the statement that Jesus just made? Out of all the people ever born of a woman, that's all of us, he said, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. And then in the next breath, he says something even more astonishing. He says, and even the least in my kingdom is greater than John. Like, I don't know what that does to you, but we have to wrestle with that. The goat called someone else the goat, and then he said, even the least in my kingdom will be greater than John. I've been wrestling with this for, for weeks. Um, how does someone in the kingdom of God become the goat? Well, I think the secret is in the meaning of John's name. Because here, here's the deal. My, my desire today is not to have us be overly impressed with John the Baptist. Because what happens is sometimes we become so impressed with people that we don't actually follow their example. We just say, they're like Michael Jordan. They're on another level. When I talk about John's life, I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about not John, but the grace that was on John. See, because John the Baptist is probably one of the last people I would ever think to want to pull out of the cloud of witnesses to spend time with. Let's be real. John the Baptist, if he's around, we're not inviting him to any conference. You're not speaking at my church. You are a liability. <laughs> like, I'm having you sign waiver after waiver after waiver before this guy opens his mouth. And yet, regardless of our comfort level with John, John is not who I feel he is. He is who Jesus says he is. How many of you know you're not who people think you are? You are who God says you are. And in this day and age, that means a lot. So John, his name, I believe the secret of how he became who he was is in his name. Because his name literally means graced by God. Graced by God. So what makes goats? I'm here to tell you today, grace makes goats. Grace makes goats, not grit. Not your personality, not your upbringing, not your prayer and fasting and Bible study. God, that's all good. It's all God, and God will use all of it. But it's not what makes greatness in the kingdom of God. It's the grace of God. Can I get an amen? So today, I want to I pull out four traits from John's life. There may be moments where there's crickets in this room. There may be moments where you think what I'm saying is contrary to some of the things you've heard today. I promise you it's not. It's complimentary. But I have been stirred looking at the life of John, and I want to give you four traits of what a modern-day forerunner looks like from the life of John the Baptist. Transformational traits. The first thing is this. If grace makes goats, number one, grace empowers you to live by a holy vow. Luke 1, it says... For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. Basically, this is a Nazarite vow. You're familiar with this. I used to think that a Nazarite vow was so crazy. Then I realized, wait a second. Long hair's coming back. Like, I mean, Pastor Chris, you could rock a mullet if you wanted to. Like, this, this is not, no haircuts, right? Don't spend time with dead people. Not really my thing. And uh, alcohol is not a part of my life. So, like, we're pretty close to a Nazarite vow. So, so he's got this. It says, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Incredible. Why would God have to do that for this young man? Because the calling on his life would be so incredibly intense that without the power of the Holy Spirit, it would never happen. He will bring many people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, watch this, to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make a people ready for the Lord. Grace empowers you and I to live by a holy vow. John chose to push aside the regular comforts of life for a season in his calling. He wore uncomfortable clothes. He wore a coarse camel hair. I mean, you, you know the story. He pushed aside. I mean, eating locusts. You thought your keto diet was hard. <laughs> Even John the Baptist had a cheat day. He's like, I need some honey on that today. Like, this is... 
But he pushed aside the comforts of life. He lived in the wilderness. Listen, last month my family went camping in West Virginia. I'm looking at my boys, 14 and 16. I'm like, we need to toughen these guys up a little bit. We need to go camping. We need to sleep a few nights in a tent and go out in the wilderness. And uh, we spent only a couple days in a tent, and then we rented a cabin, an Airbnb, and we came out of the wilderness. And my boys think that they are legit frontiersmen now. (laughs) This is why. Not because we ate over a campfire, not because we hiked, and not because we did whitewater rapids. They think they're ready for auditioning for the TV show alone. Because there was dreadfully, painfully slow Wi-Fi in our cabin that was an Airbnb. This is craziness, people. The wilderness. I hate the wilderness. Do you realize God brings everyone he loves into the wilderness? Everyone. It's inescapable. It's a place of preparation. It's a place where you grow strong in your spirit and God develops a resiliency in you for things that you're going to step into that you don't even know are coming yet. He brought Elijah into the wilderness. Paul spent time in the Arabian desert. His own son Jesus spent time in the wilderness. I mean, I've heard so many giants in the faith talk about 2020 as the toughest year of their lives. Aren't you so glad God will never waste a wilderness? Like, he will not waste a wilderness. When, in fact, the Spirit of God said to me, when all of us were kind of like thinking, what in the world is happening? God said to me, he said, Josh, you will look back on 2020, and that season won't be defined by a virus, but it will be refined by my voice. And I tell you what, the voice of God, how many of you have been feeling a sensitizing to the voice of God? Like, like never, you're like, I'm pushing this comfort life aside. I can't numb out on Netflix. Like, I, I, I thank God for some of these distractions. But I tell you what, now's the time we need to be alert and listening to the Spirit of God like never before. There's a resilience. And, and John, he's just, he's just a bit weird, right? He's like, he's probably an Enneagram 8. He's got to be a challenger. Like, not that, I, some of the closest people in my life are Enneagram 8s, like, But John, he's like a bit different. But I want to say to you this, and I I mean this with all sincerity. We have to be careful that we don't regulate the voice of God to our personalities, to our preferences, and to our comforts. Because sometimes the voices that we dislike the most are the voices that we need the most. Jesus called John the goat. The problem is there's so much pressure right now around us that people are saying and doing stupid things. And not just our people. All, how many of you have said some dumb things over the past 18 months? The pressure to squeeze some stuff out of you. are like, I should have prayed that instead of saying it. <laughs> but you know, I started comforting myself recently because... If you look back at church history, the year was 325 A.D. and Constantine was the emperor and he had called a council together of 300 bishops because there was a heretic in the church named Arius who was saying that Jesus was not equal to the Father and the Trinity is a pretty big deal. And so these 300 bishops are there and Arius is making his case and he is like line upon line legally like trying to convince the bishops why Jesus is not equal to the Father. And there's one bishop in particular that is just getting more and more fired up as he hears what's happening. He walks across the room in front of the emperor and punches Arius in the face. (laughs) Now, I'm not advocating for violence of any kind, seriously. But that bishop's name was St. Nicholas. (laughs) Did you know that St. Nick... Like, even St. Nick lost it every once in a while. (laughs) Like, could we give grace to each other with all the pressure that's happening? We're not always going to handle it right. So can can we agree to give some grace instead of some judgment when we don't understand one another's calling? John was an odd bird. He, he, there was a unique calling. And, And can I just say this? Every one of God's kids have a unique calling on their lives. He never does carbon copy. He never does wash, rinse, and repeat. How many of you know God is far too creative for that? So when you don't understand the grace or the anointing or what's coming from someone's life, we've got to give a little less judgment and a little less grace to one another in the body of Christ. 
I, I love this quote from Paul Scanlon. Check this out. Watch this. It's not everyone's job to understand your calling. It wasn't a conference call. <laughs> Chew on that. John had a unique calling, but I believe there's an aspect of John's life that we need to be willing to embrace as a body of Christ in this season. Who wants to be around John, honestly? That's like, my question. When I'm reading through God, I'm like, who wants to be around this guy? He is so intense. Well, apparently, everyone. The Bible says that he didn't have to set up meetings in Jerusalem. They all came out to the wilderness to see him. I guarantee some came because they wanted to see the freak show, mock him, but he drew members of every sector of society. Can I tell you that when your roots in God go so deep, you don't have to chase people down. You don't have to chase opportunity. People will find you. They'll find what you're doing. They will be drawn to your life. People from all walks of life because of the grace that was on him. I thought he would repel everyone. And yet, what does it say? They found him in the wilderness. They left the city and went out to where he was. God, we need that grace. So we can talk to governors and prostitutes and whoever needs to hear the gospel. John, there was an attractional quality on his life that's astonishing. So I want to ask you this question. Where is the Spirit of God drawing you closer in this season? Where is grace leading you into a fresh vow? Don't get religiously hung up on whatever vow you have. The, the whole point of a vow is the voice of God. I got to get closer to the voice of God. The voice of God is what houses spiritual growth. What, what does it look like for you in this season to, to set aside the bread and circuses of our culture? Because Here's the deal. Listen, we, we have been through a traumatizing season. And pa pain always seeks pleasure. But what pain really needs is fresh purpose. So I don't need to numb out on Netflix, even though I think that's what I want. I don't need to eat three gallons of ice cream, even though I think that's what I want. I actually need a sensitivity to the voice of God, because when I hear from God, he births something new in my life. Grace will lead you to a fresh and holy vow. Second trait of John's life I see is that grace teaches you to embrace your value, your true value. John 1, 6, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Isn't it interesting that God was talking about John 700 years before he was born? Isaiah chapter 40. I believe there's a dramatic shift that takes place in your life when you deeply believe that you were not just randomly born, but you were sent by God. Listen, you were not just an idea of your parents. You were literally sent. You, you weren't born, you were sent. We read this and we're like, wow, that's amazing for John. No, no, you weren't just born, you were sent. There's a call. God could have chose any generation to drop you in. My wife and I were like kind of thinking about, oh, our kids are missing so much and all this is happening. And then we realized God chose for them to be born in this time so he could put a certain grace on them. You weren't just born, you were sent. And when you know your value, you, in this season, I believe heaven is reminding us that their perspective is that you were not just born, you were sent. And can I tell you that you were sent to this time, you were sent to this tribe, you weren't just desiring to serve God, you were called. Your calling is essential. Your church is essential. I don't care what culture says. We, we're like, why is the liquor store open? Why are all these strip clubs open? And the world's saying you're not, you are essential. You are necessary. Your dream is necessary. Your gifting is essential. He chose you. And you know, I'm all for staying in your lane when it comes to, you know, we love that phrase, and I say it all the time, stay in your lane, stay in your lane. I'm for staying in your lane when it comes to your gifting and your competency. I don't like the cultural pressure for the church to somewhat stay in your lane because guess what? Culture didn't give you your calling and culture can't limit how far the reaches of the church reach to serve people with the message of the kingdom. Amen, Pastor Josh. Okay, Luke 1, watch this. This is the first prophecy in 400 years and it's from Zechariah the priest over his son. And he says, and to you, my little son... Come on, sonship, right there in the first prophecy of the New Testament. Our, our authority comes from identity. He says, you, my son. John, he's speaking value into John. 
Can I just tell you that when you hear value, it produces valor in your life. You will be known as the prophet of the Most High. You will be a forerunner going before the Lord, the face of Yahweh, to prepare the hearts of people to embrace His ways. You'll preach to people the revelation of salvation, the cancellation of all our sins, and bring us back to God. He's prophesying over His Son. Afterward, their son grew up and was strengthened by the Holy Spirit and grew in his love for God. You know, some of John's value and calling came directly from God, but a lot of it didn't. A lot of it came from his parents and the people in his life speaking over him. That's why I love so much what John was talking about, praying for your kids. Some of it will come directly from God, but listen, if you are a parent, a coach, a teacher, do not minimize when you speak into the destiny of someone else. I guarantee John needed to be reminded of the story over and over and over of the significance of his birth. When you know your value, it gives you valor in this life. John was courageous. Because he knew his value, he was willing to celebrate Jesus and step back when it was his time to disappear. He was, he was secure enough to play second. He was happy to be the, the best man and not the bridegroom. He, he willingly did it. And you know, that, that's a tough thing. That is a challenging thing for us, isn't it? I, lo I love the, co the comedian Jim Gaffigan. He said he was speaking at this uh, large sea of people, the largest event he ever spoke at. It was this, this Catholic event, and uh, he said he called his mom to explain how great of an event it was that he was speaking at. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in this arena, and oh, by the way, the Pope is speaking after me. He said... He goes, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I realize that all those people did not come to hear Jim Caffigan. They came to hear the Pope. How many of you know John was secure enough in himself to say, listen, don't look at me. In fact, look past me, look through me, look around me. But really what you want to see is Jesus. And when you know your value, you're willing to do that. But John knew that this holy consecration also had to lead to holy action. And his spirit-led action would not be popular. It wouldn't pull well in Galilee. It wouldn't pull well in Judea. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've been thinking a lot about history, and, and you have to bear with me. I'm, I am a bit of a history nerd. No, I am a history nerd. I'll just say that. Our, our revolutionary fathers that were thankful they threw off tyranny from England... Um, you know, I read a tweet the other day, a tweet, yeah, he's not alive anymore. Thomas Jefferson, a quote that was tweeted. He said, when tyranny becomes law, rebellion becomes duty. So I'm not an advocate for insurrections. I'm not an advocate for war because Paul said our weapons are not carnal, but are even mightier than that. We are in a spiritual battle right now for our nation, right? We are. But what's interesting to me is we love our heroes dead and from a safe distance, we're thankful for what they did. But if they were alive today, I'm not sure I would like them. In fact, at the time of the Revolutionary War to break off the tyranny of England, did you know that only 30% of the colonists were in favor of that war? And they did it anyways, and we're thankful for it. But if I don't have room for any prophetic agitators in my life... John, John was an agitator. He was able to do it because he knew his value. Let, let, me, let me just say, um, throw, this, throw this next picture up. This is what most of us felt like this year. No, no, no. Sorry, go to the next one. The, we'll get to the chair next. Go to the, go to the meme. Look at this picture of the cut. Here we go. My friend, this is where you've been this year. You are not OJ in the white Bronco, but it says pastors. You have been chased. You have been harassed. You have faced pressure from every viewpoint, conviction, angle that is, is possible. Right? Are you with me? Listen, I didn't, I didn't prepare this message living from the safety of a monastery. Our campuses are as distinctly different as you can imagine in Maryland. We have a campus in Rising Sun, Maryland that has been a stronghold for the KKK for so many decades. Literally, just before the shutdown, the lockdown, the KKK visited every house and put a package on the front steps and misquoted scripture saying why we should have racism in America. Still, it's, it's baffling to me. 
And so what do we do? We go in and we preach the gospel of the kingdom in the middle of that. And I, can I tell you, that's our fastest growing campus right now. Why? Because everyone needs the message of the kingdom. So we have another campus in Middle River that's a lot closer to Baltimore that's much more diverse. How, how do you pastor a group of people who could not be more different? I tell you, it takes courage. And it takes the gospel. That's what everyone wants. John, I, I believe this. I believe the moment we find ourselves in right now is that we, when you know your value, you're able to lean into God's approval instead of man's acceptance. Can I say to you that, listen, the value that you're going to have to draw from and live from has to be internal and not external. I'll, I'll say it in COVID terms because we understand this. Listen, the praise and affirmation of people is off the menu. In fact, the restaurant shut down. <laughs> I'm telling you, you, we have to live with such a sense of value so they're not, we're not looking for the attaboy from people because it's a tough time to lead. And so that means I need to have roots in God more than straws in people. We don't like it when people try to put straws in us and suck the life out of us. But the truth is, you and I, we need deep roots in God instead of straws in people. Because you can't live a life like John the Baptist speaking the truth courageously if you're looking for external value and affirmation from people. You've got to get it from a different source. That will never shut down. That love and acceptance is always on the menu. John, he knew his value. He lived by a holy vow. Number three, grace teaches us to release our prophetic voice. I have greatly benefited from prophetic voices. When I was going off course, so many different times. And not just to predict the future in some way, although there are times where prophetic words were so timely for us. But I needed people close to me that could speak the truth of God wrapped in the heart of God. That's a prophetic voice. When you speak the truth of God wrapped in the heart of God. But how many of you know, those, those voices that come to us prophetically are not always the most welcome. <laughs> we need them, but we don't always want them. Come on, church. When we were at the Airbnb in West Virginia, I went into this room where they had this, like, garage for laundry and everything else. And I'm like, why are there so many washing machines in here? And so I'm checking out all the washing machines. And I realized that one of them, it was an old school washing machine, not one of the, uh, like, uh, front loaders. It was one of those top loaders, and it didn't have the agitator in it. How many of you know, no agitator, no cleaning? It's the same for the prophetic voices in our life. The voice that I tend to resist the most is the voice that I often need the most. And can I, can I say that God has been cleaning out spots and wrinkles in our lives, hasn't he, over this season? He's not going to waste a wilderness. Number three, he, re, he teaches us how and when to release our prophetic voice. It says in Luke 3 of John, as it was written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley, every low and humble place shall be filled in, and every mountain, every high and exalted and proud place will be made low. The crooked roads shall become straight and the rough ways smooth. W what is the message? Everyone needs to be readied for the coming king. Everyone has to make adjustments. And all the people will see God's salvation. Jesus said this of John. Jesus said, they enjoyed the light of John's life for a time until they couldn't take it anymore. Jesus said that. And so I want, I'm pulling apart John's sermon right now because there's, there's three things that his prophetic voice spoke into that I think are very relevant for us. Number one, uh, as people were coming, the crowds were coming to him, diverse crowds coming to him. Luke three ten says this, they looked at John and said, what shall we do then, the crowd asked. Here's John's message. Number one, practice compassion. He said, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Like, I'm expecting some, like, deep spiritual revelation. John says, listen, hey, practice compassion. Can I just say how proud I was to see the churches of Elam Fellowship inspiring one another during COVID. The How many of you know the creativity that went through the roof when you realize we've got to minister to people, but we can't touch them? 
Like, I've got I've to love on you extravagantly, but I can't get near you. So you guys set up drive throughs in your parking lot and gave out food. People are writing old school letters and sending them to nursing homes. People are doing nursing home visits through windows. I mean, the creativity. I don't know how many bicycles Legacy Church gave away. Uh, Freedom Life now has a school that they're occupying, turning into a regional center for, for outreach. I'm like, honestly, inspired. We gave away probably almost a million pounds of food in Baltimore. People were coming out of the woodwork to help. and don't. It got to the point where we were giving away 2,000 hot meals a day. Every day. We had people coming through our line that have never asked for help in their lives. I'm telling you, luxury SUVs. People, people having to get over the shame of being needy. And, and you know what? We were able to serve them and, and sow seeds. And, and so many of you did that. John said practice compassion. The next thing he said is show character. I'm just reading John's sermon. He said, it says, even the tax collectors came to be baptized, and teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to do, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? It's amazing. They're under Roman occupation, and the soldiers are coming to John. Isn't it amazing that God can even attract what would be your societal enemies close to you? Because the gospel sees none of that. He says, listen, don't extort people for money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Show some character. What does that look like for us? I, I think that's not bad-mouthing other pastors that are doing things a different way. Making gossip uncomfortable around us. Uh, keeping your word even under fire. Being reliable. I don't know, using your PPP funds with integrity. I mean, we could go on and on and on. E Elam is built on character and integrity. Be gracious to church people when they are losing their minds. Practice compassion. Show character. And the last one is this. Resist corruption. This is where it gets juicy. John, uh, Luke 3, it says, But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch meaning he was over four regions, because of his marriage to Herodias, if you study history, Herodias... I actually, it would be sinful if I tried to talk about the things that this woman did. She literally caused nations to go to war with one another over her promiscuity. And that's where we'll leave it. <laughs> it said, but John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch for his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done. Jesus called him the goat. He added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Okay. I'm not sure if they have my email address on a slide, but it's josh at myfreedom.org. That's my legit email address. So if what I'm about to say you don't uh, uh, agree with, don't email Pastor Chris. <laughs> Even though he made me preach last. We're still friends. Listen, Ecclesiastes says there's a time to speak and a time not to speak. I believe that when you speak spirit-led, you represent the voice of God. When you vent, you make a point without making a difference. I think because so many people have been venting, that we have to be careful as the body of Christ to not close off our hearts and close off our ears to when the voice of God speaks something that may be uncomfortable. I'm concerned because in the body of Christ, we have such a tendency to swing the pendulum and I'm talking to leaders all over the country, and I'm saying, listen, let, let, me, let me unpack this a little bit. I believe God is maturing the big C church. This is not an indictment on Elam Fellowship. This is not about Elam Gospel. This is the big C church. I believe the Spirit of God is maturing us so that we are able to stay on spiritual mission and speak to the broken places of society. Well, John the Baptist baffles me because here he is, water baptizing people. He's got a revival going, and yet he's still speaking truth to power. And I, so here's the deal, and I know it's a tension to manage because most of my friends are like, I just want to keep it about the gospel, and I'm not going to talk about anything my people are dealing with. And then other friends are like, everything out of their mouth is political, and they're losing sight of the gospel. This is the world we live in right now. 
I love that John has a revival, water baptizing people, and is able to still speak to the broken places of society. There's something we can learn from this. Charles Finney in 1831. He was preaching in Rochester. The, the greatest documented revival we have in our nation's history. In the middle of the revival, while 10,000 people are giving their lives to Christ, what is Charles Finney doing? He's also speaking against slavery. He was willing to speak to the broken places of society and stay on mission spiritually. I believe only by the grace of God can we do both. And you know what? You're not going to be perfect, but I think we have to be willing. Because our people deserve it. And our communities deserve it. John was able to do both. I, I just believe in the core of my being that we need to exhibit a level of spiritual dexterity to be able to do a both and approach rather than just either or. Are you with me? I believe that we have to move in such humility and deference to the fivefold offices of the body of Christ because I find myself saying to myself, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't do that. But you know what? God doesn't really care. That's not my personality. That's not my cup of tea. That's not my comfort level. It's, 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 it can be a dangerous place to be. And here's the deal. You're like, Josh, listen, I, I want... I want our church to be known by what we're for, not what we're against. Listen, I am a thousand percent with you. But sometimes we can't just be the compassionate hands and feet of Christ. Sometimes we also have to be the courageous backbone of Christ. I think we've become so accustomed to trying to express the, the Lamb of God that we forget that he's also the Lion of Judah. I, I, I just think there's something in the spirit. The same Jesus that taught us to turn the other cheek also turned some tables. Hello. Uh, can, you, can you appreciate, listen, if we try to dissolve the tension, we fail to live up to, Jesus said, John is the goat. But even the ones of my children that come that are the least in the kingdom afterwards will be greater than John. That means I have to learn something from John and receive some grace even though I would never associate with that kind of person or ministry. I believe we have room to grow. Brother, listen, I don't want to be divisive. I don't either. Trust me, listen, Jesus in John 8, he caught, they caught the woman in the act of adultery and you know the story. When we need love the most, we deserve it the least. There, there are things happening in our church right now. It's, it's, it, it's honestly great because some of the religious people are getting, they're freaking out because the gay community is coming in, in unprecedented numbers. Um, it's just, I have personally watched two women transform their lives and step out of lesbian relationships and be just, I'm completely changed. On fire for Jesus, water baptized, growing, all kinds of things they're still dealing with. Right? So, so, we, so we know that we've got this John 8 Jesus and we have to lead with grace before we even have the right to give truth. Nine times out of ten. But there are times where we have to lead with truth. Jesus, you know, they would have never hired Jesus to be like one of the Hallmark card creators. The same Jesus that saw the woman in John 8 also said, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. And even the truth of God's word would divide even into families. What do I do with this Jesus? I believe there is something far worse than being labeled disruptive or even divisive. And it's called disobedient. God may call you to say things with a heart full of love, choking back tears that could be painful for people, but it could save their lives. In our noble attempt to not be divisive, have we become passive in this pressurized moment? I believe the new levels of tension require new levels of intention. I just want some of what was on John's life to come onto us. Whatever measure we need to fulfill our portion of history. Brother, I just don't want to be political. I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. 
Can I tell you, I, like, it, <laughs> I agree with you a thousand percent. But Jesus said, listen, tell Herod that fox. Tell Herod that fox that I'm going to cast out devils and heal the sick. I'll do it today. I'll do it tomorrow. And on the third day, I'm going to reach my goal. But he's not going to dictate to me the calling my father has given me. We got to do something with that. Jesus said, listen, that didn't, get, that didn't give Herod warm and fuzzies. <laughs> Jesus said, listen, I'm not after your seat. I have a higher seat. <laughs> I have a throne, thank you very much, and I didn't come to bring a political kingdom. I came to be, bring the kingdom of heaven, and all the other kingdoms are going to come and bow down to that. But you don't get there unless you're willing to release your prophetic voice in the right time, in the right way, the truth of God wrapped in the heart of God. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the religious spirit. We're familiar with that. We want to stay away from that. He said, beware of the leaven of Herod. That's the political spirit. Can I just confess to you that I, I was so frustrated when all this tension was happening because I'm just kind of like, can we just have some fun and win people to Jesus? Like, that's really, honestly, my personality. Uh, and I found myself judging other people who were speaking into areas that I'm like, did that need to be said? And I said to myself, look at they're being influenced by a political spirit. Some of them are. Some of them are just adding to the noise. But then I felt like the Spirit of God asked me a question. What if my non-speaking was also being influenced by a political spirit? No one can answer that for you but you and God. No one. We don't have an Elam Fellowship playbook on what you should speak to and what you shouldn't. There's a time to speak and a time not to speak. But I'm exhorting us to not trade our pastoral courage for political correctness. I'm exhorting us to not spiritualize our personality and our preferences. How many of you know God cares about every issue of life? And because politics and education and the economy right now touch more people than the body of Christ, that is an area where we need servant leaders that are willing to have the courage to love people that you'll get judged for and speak truth to people that might not want to hear it. Jesus called John the goat. And I'll just tell you this. You know this. It's not a Trump thing. It's not a Biden thing. The Democrats don't have the answers, and the Republicans don't have the answers. I am not looking to the left or to the right. I'm looking up for the answers. Listen, we're, we're like, <laughs> we're getting excited because we're like, well, are we close to the second coming? Everyone's, you know, it, it's amazing the questions you start getting from your people, Right? It's not an issue of mask or no mask or vax or no vax or, you know, is it the mark of the beast? What's in this thing? I mean, all the stuff we get, these, these questions, right? We're like, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come. And you know what Jesus is saying? Go, church, go. There's no one else coming. You are my plan A. It's not the CDC. It's not the WHO. It's not the White House. He's waiting for the church to do what we do. Man-made systems will never be able to fix this problem. I love our heart for the nations. Love it. It's one of the greatest things that's ever been imparted to me at Elam. Christianity could survive without America. I hate what's happening in Afghanistan. The second fastest growing church on the planet is in Afghanistan. When America is strong and healthy, we give more money and more missionaries to the global cause of nations. Everyone prospers when we are doing well. Christianity can still survive without America, but America cannot survive without Christianity. The real thing, like the real thing. I believe that under the Spirit of God, he's going to give you opportunities to speak the truth of God wrapped in the heart of God where you won't just make a point, you'll make a difference. I'm not saying embracing some kind of radical fundamentalism where you become critical of everyone and you don't know how to become a friend to sinners. That's, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, Pastor Chris, he challenged us in our, our retreat this week. He said, it's not what you believe only, it's how you believe what you believe. We have to live this out. I'm not saying you need to let the news cycle dictate your sermon series. 
But I am saying you need to talk about the most important issues that are happening in our nation because I feel like there are many sheep without shepherds. They're talking about things and saying, am I crazy? What's really happening right now? And they need some leaders who are willing to say, Spirit of God, would you give me an ability to speak the truth of God wrapped in the heart of God? I may not be popular. It may not poll well. But because of the heart you've given me to lead people, I'm willing to release my prophetic voice. Our culture is trying to define the purest expression of love as tolerance. It's not. Jesus taught us that it's righteous influence. What did he say that you and I were? He said, you're salt. Salt was so precious back in the day that it's actually where we get the word salary. It was the money that they, they gave to Roman soldiers, salt. What does salt do? It doesn't just make you thirsty, right? Salt, it preserves from decay. Do you know that your life where you're planted is preserving your community from decay if you're willing to let the grace of God flow through you? He said you're salt. He said you're light. What does that bring? Perspective in the darkness. And he said you are leaven, which will work its way through every piece of society, the whole batch of dough. Again, I'm a history nerd, so I'll share a couple things with you as we get ready to close. I was looking at the pastors in Germany and asking myself the question, how could they not resist what was happening in World War II to a greater degree? Martin Luther's Reformation had impacted that part of the world so greatly that the nation was predominantly Lutheran, and I know some incredible Lutherans. I have such a respect for the sovereignty of God, but I also know that there is responsibility within the sovereignty of God. And I believe if we're not careful in pressurized situations, we can swing to, to such extremes and say, well, God is just sovereign, it'll all work out. And listen, I believe God is sovereign and it will all work out. But it will all work out because we take our responsibility led by the Spirit of God, giving the truth and love of God. So the churches, I believe, had a lazy approach to the sovereignty of God. The other thing is, and this is big, no one wants to lose members, and, and no one wants to not have money to feed your family. They were on the state payroll. Hitler wasn't talking about bringing in fascism. He was talking about bringing in socialism. And they were all paid. The pastors of that day, their salaries were covered by the German state. You say, how do they not speak up? When the trains were heading to the concentration camps and the Jewish people were crying on the trains, what did they do? They turned up the organ and they sang the hymns louder. When my community and my neighbors are crying and I just say, God, I just want a little more Mav City. Like, I just, I just need my own time of worship. And I, that's all beautiful. But how many of you know there's more we can do than that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. The man was a pacifist and a theologian. And now we look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer writing The Cost of Discipleship, and we're like, that guy was a, a, a hero. He died at 39 years old, resisting the onslaught and the march of what Hitler was trying to do because he knew it was going to affect millions of people around the globe. I don't know what it looks like for you to engage in the spiritual warfare. I'm going to give you a couple suggestions as we close. But I believe that we can't turn our churches into echo chambers where there's not diversity of thought. And I believe we can't turn them into spiritual bunkers where we're isolated from the issues of our day because they're just too polarizing. I, here, here's the thing. If you're going to smack the bee's nest, use the biggest stick you have. It's called the cross. It's called the cross of Jesus Christ. It's called the grace of God. It's called the one thing that all of humanity is craving for. And so what did Paul say? Paul said, I have not given you, God has not given you a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. What does that mean? Power. We need to pray powerful prayers. The Holy Spirit said to me as we were getting ready to speak, he said, tell the, tell the leaders there's a difference between hitting the panic button and sounding an alarm. The panic button is pressed in fear. Sounding the alarm is with God-given faith saying, listen, God is not going to do something. He has already started to do something. Well, what is it? Is it pressurized and craziness in the political scene or is it a move of God? Yes. Jesus said in Matthew 13 that the wheat and the leaven would, the wheat and the tares would grow up next to each other. Right now, it just seems like the tares are getting a little taller than the wheat. But guess what? We know how the story ends. 
He said, power, that, to me that speaks of prayer. I don't believe, and Pastor Chris said this too, I don't believe the pressure is going away anytime soon. That means we need a resiliency in prayer. If I don't become resilient in prayer, I will develop some kind of addiction. Entertainment, food, something to numb the pain. I'll become crotchety, edgy, right? Power, love. What does it mean? It means we truly hear people. It means that we believe at the core of our being that grace is stronger than sin. It means that when people draw circles that exclude you, you draw bigger circles that include them. Listen, I'm a 40-year-old white guy through and through. A week from today, I will be in the most dangerous neighborhood in Baltimore City. God will lead you to places that you don't feel like you belong because you have things to say to people who need to hear it. But if you think that that's just for the crazy radicals like John the Baptist or other people, you will miss out on what God... Or if you say, God would never ask me to do that. Randy Stewart, one of our credential holders, said this. It was so powerful to me. He said, their, their team came up with three statements, and I just throw this out there for you because I feel like it's so powerful. He said, when we look at the polarization of what we're facing, we have determined, we're talking about power and love, love... He said, we will condemn, we will not condemn anyone. Number two, we will not condone anything the Bible calls sin. Number three, we will lean into the transformative power of the gospel above all else. How many of you know that's a pretty good strategy? We will not condemn anyone, but we will not in the same breath condone anything the Bible says is sin. And we will lean into the power of the gospel power, love, sound mind. What does that mean? Here, I believe, is the challenge of our day. How do you love people and also demolish dangerous ideologies? Just because I have to have a soft heart doesn't mean I can't have a sound mind. There are ideologies being fed to our children. And listen, I don't have much more, so just, just hang with me. Don't trust my word for this. Study this out for yourself. But I believe one of the most dangerous, and it's, it's insidious because we all have a heart for justice, and we all have a heart for compassion, and we all understand that, that racism and inequality is evil. But this idea of critical theory, can I just tell you why it's antithetical to the gospel? I think we get this, but critical theory, the enemy knows that a house divided can't stand. So he's trying to divide us by sexism, racism, and classism. Three ways. And critical theory is becoming a religion. There are prophets, there are original sin, there are preachers, there, I mean all of it. Here's the deal. Through all of the struggle, there is no salvation. When I look at the gospel, it doesn't divide. It unites us in solidarity and says every single person is a child of God made in the image of God with infinite worth. And it unites us in solidarity that every single one of us are sinners in need of salvation that I can't gain through social justice or doing things or a struggle. I have to receive it as a free gift. I, I suggest to you that critical theory is antithetical to the gospel. It's, a, it's an, I, listen, I would always think when Paul said, tear down every lofty thought and make it obedient to Christ. I would personalize it in my mind, only my mind. How many of you know we have to pray, we have to love people, and have a sound mind corporately and collectively? Amen. It's no bueno. <laughs> As kingdom leaders, I believe God is going to give you grace. I know you know how much is at stake. And I'm not a crazy um, Christian nationalist, as they might try to call. <laughs> but I do believe it's God's idea to have nations. Hezekiah committed one of the most despicable things in the Old Testament when he got his miracle and God said, you'll live another 15 years. 
He said, but after you, it's all going to fall apart. He said, what do I care? I won't be here. God wants to give us a heart for the generations to come after us. That means we're going to have to have courage. That means like Jesus, a lot of people may label you and try to put you in a box that you don't fit in. Because one day, you're in dangerous neighborhoods feeding the poor and doing things. And the next day, you're speaking truth to power. And the next day, you're with this group. And the next day, you're, you're loving your neighbor and you're learning how to neighbor. And, and guess what? People won't figure out what to do with you, but they'll be drawn to the grace of God on your life. I believe that if we don't protect some of the rights we have, our kids will never even know that they existed. I only have children. I don't have grandchildren, but I think about my grandkids a lot. We need to pray. We need to love people. We need to have a sound mind. The last thing Grace taught John, a holy vow, a voice. He knew his value, and here's the last part of his story, and you know this. Grace teaches you to look to Jesus when your faith vacillates. I'm so glad this is in Scripture because John looked like a superhero up to this point. How many of you had your faith vacillate a little bit? I'm not talking, you don't have to deconstruct. You just had some doubts over the past 18 months. You know, it doesn't make you a hypocrite. It makes you human. When John, who was in prison, oh, by the way, rotting away for a year, he's 31 years old. He's this prophetic. Jesus called him the goat. He's about to leave this planet after 31 years only. He said to his disciples, could you ask Jesus just one more time if he was really who I thought he was? Because he's not doing exactly what I thought he'd be doing. And Jesus sends this reply and he quotes Isaiah back to John and he says, the lame are being healed and the deaf and all that. And he leaves out and the captives will be set free. He sends John a message and says, John, I am who I said I was. Your life and your ministry was not in vain. Even though this trial for you won't end well, your life has not been in vain. John, I love that Jesus puts this in there. I love that God shows the human side of John. Even John vacillated. But you don't have to be perfect to fulfill your assignment. You just need the grace of God. It's grace that makes goats. Would you stand with me? John was a forerunner paving the way for Jesus' first coming, his first arrival. And I believe God can put a grace on us to pave the way for his second. It's grace that makes goats. I want you just, just to begin to pray in the Spirit just for a moment. Just begin to just pray in the Spirit. Paul Johansson taught me that prayer is the birthplace of strong faith. Go ahead, just pray in the Spirit. <clears throat> As we close in a song of worship, just a moment, I want us just to pray. I want you to join me in just lifting your voice. God, I thank you that you have a solution to every problem we are facing and will face in the days ahead. I thank you in Psalm 2, you said the nations may rage and they may scoff, but you sit in heaven and you laugh and you just say, kiss the sun before he comes to rule with an iron rod. You said in Hebrews 12 that you are shaking everything. Come on, lift your voice. Just begin to lift your voice. Praying. He is shaking everything that can be shaken, but we live in an unshakable kingdom. He said, I'll use the manifold wisdom of the church. I'll use the manifold wisdom of the church to speak to the strongholds of the day. God, I ask like they asked in Acts 4. When they said, do you think we should obey you or we should obey God? They said, would you grant your servants great boldness? God, I ask that you would release great boldness. I ask that you would release supernatural compassion. I ask that great boldness, God, would fill our hearts. Jesus, may the fire in your eyes become the fire in our hearts.
close with this. My grandfather was a great man of God. 68 years old, he was out ice skating. He fell and broke his hip. And for the rest of his life, he had this, as a young grandchild, I, I thought it was a, like a Marvel character super ability almost to know when the weather was going to change. I said, Grandpa, how do you know the weather's changing? And because he had broken his hip and had to live with that, and back in the day they weren't as good at hip replacement, and he would say, I feel it in my bones. How many of you, you feel it in your bones? The weather is changing. The spiritual climate is changing. It's not coming down the road. It's already in motion. It's already happening. And you have a significant part to play. The grace of God on your life is essential. Come on, just begin to just lift your voice. We're going to pray. We're going to pray because God has already started a fresh move. He's already said, I am bringing revival. I'm not shaken. I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset. The smile of heaven is the covering of your life, the banner of your life, the protection of your life. When people don't understand your calling, don't worry. It was never a conference call to begin with. God called you. He chose you. He anointed you to serve the God, I thank you for that internal value system. God, would you release fresh mercy and compassion and wisdom that with power and love and a sound mind we would usher in your arrival. That we would prepare the way, whether it's for our children or our grandchildren, God, that we would not shrink back in the hour that you have given us. Come on, let's just turn this song into our prayer.